morning, everyone. This is Chris Mullins from CapEx Sales. Thanks for joining us. Uh, today we have a, a, a guest from Duquesne. His name is Josh Brown. He's the sales, global sales manager for the laser division. And uh, he is going to uh, present laser welding for plastic assemblies and uh, talk to us about the various technologies. Uh, we're very glad to have you with us, Josh. Thanks for joining. Yeah, no problem. Glad to be here. Very good. Well, I'm going to let uh, turn it over to you and let you drive your presentation and uh, we'll go from there. Excellent. Thanks, Chris. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, like Chris said, my name is Josh Brown. I'm the global sales manager for uh, Duquesne Laser Plastic Welding. Uh, my team here, we're located in Oregon. We've been doing this for about 11 years now uh, between uh, uh, each. And so um, that being said, been working with Duquesne for a couple of years now, and we put this this roadmap together. So I'm I'm switching back and forth between these slides. This this presentation is really designed to be a little bit technical, but also kind of help people start with their questions in terms of how to get into a laser plastic welding application, what type of questions to expect, and things that we're going to be looking at. But then also discuss some of the the technical angles and and why going after laser plastic welding is effective. So. Um, that agenda is going to look uh, like this. We'll do um, we'll do some, uh, basically go through all of this, and then if there's any questions that come up, we will answer those either at the end or if they do fit in nicely, we'll we'll take it on the fly. But essentially, what we're going to cover today is the advantages and disadvantages of laser welding. First, just to kind of give you an idea of why you would even be considering laser welding. Uh, and then before we get into the technical stuff, we're going to cover just a quick project roadmap. And, and that really is there to show you the types of questions you should be expecting from any, any company you work with, whether it's uh, CapEx sales in Duquesne or, or another company. Um, in, important data points from your end and questions that we'll be asking to ensure that your project is successful. Uh, past that, we'll look at the two different types of laser plastic welding. We call them internally one micron and two micron. Uh, so we'll show you the differences between those and why you would select either or for differing applications. And then we will go into the specifics of each in the one micron technical overview and the two micron technical overview. Uh, and then we'll show a few example applications. And then if we have uh, questions, we'll go into a Q&A. So that being said, let's get going with advantages and disadvantages. Um, when it comes to laser plastic welding, uh, we do have kind of this, this hefty slide here with a lot of different advantages. So I'm not going to list off all of these right now. Uh, the main ones to really typically focus on are the, that top left one there is the particulate free welding. That tends to be one of the primary reasons that we have people exploring laser plastic welding. So if you're switching from, say, sonic welding or friction welding uh, or even hot plate, um, laser plastic welding tends to... Uh, provide cleaner joints with fewer particulates. Uh, so those are, that's really beneficial for things in the medical device industry, especially fluid, uh, body fluid, blood devices, microfluidics, and things like that. But we're also seeing a lot of interest in this in the automotive industry as well for electronic enclosures and things where particulates could uh, potentially interfere with uh, sensitive electronics or sensor devices and things like that. And, and fuel related products as well, right? I'm sorry, what's that? I, I just uh, adding in uh, fuel related things that uh, absolutely are to fueling. Yep. Absolutely, yep. And 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 so we we really do see the full gambit of stuff in the automotive and medical device industry. Um, and particulate free is not the only reason people come over to laser welding. Uh, there's some other advantages I'll cover here too. The bond strength does tend to be really high. Um, and I'm going to jump around in some slides, but with laser plastic welding you're typically achieving 90% of the strength of the parent material, sometimes even higher than that. So for, for fuel or pump type applications, in the automotive industry, that strength requirement's really high and laser does provide a very, a very strong bond and it's very precise. So we're really only putting energy where it needs to go and it still maintains a very high strength threshold. Um, Back to this slide here, like I said, I'm not going to cover all of these, but um, just touching on a few of them, minimal thermal or mechanical stress on the part, um, you know, again, compared to say a, a more invasive approach like like hot plate or uh, friction welding or sonic welding, we're really not putting very much mechanical or thermal stress. And when I say thermal, that's because we're controlling the laser energy 
really only going into the joint. Um, the mechanical stress itself is we don't have relative motion per se between the parts. We are clamping them. So there is some mechanical stress on the part, but because we're not uh, essentially rubbing them together, uh, there's a lot less mechanical stress. So that also helps with the particulate free portion of it. But if you do have sensitive parts or small parts, uh, laser plastic welding is uh, usually quite good for those. A um, couple other things, uh, smaller parts. I'm going to show a couple of examples of those. So um, we, we do do a lot of, of, of very little parts. And again, we can get very precise with the beams. Um, the precision control, most Duquesne lasers are operating off of a galvanometric scanner. And so this is essentially showing kind of the, a very basic idea of what a galvo scanner would look like. The idea is that we can control these servos very precisely. Uh, we can adjust the beam spot size to the size that we need. And we can only put that, we only need to put the laser energy right where it's going on the joint to create really any pattern that we're after. So the precision is very good. Um, that, that also leads kind of back into that advantage I was talking to before about the thermal stress. It's, you know, we're only putting heat right into the joint and there's not a lot of heat or mechanical stress outside of the joint itself. So, and Josh, you may cover this in a little bit more detail, but as we were talking earlier about some, uh, applications I've been working on recently there, you know, and this happens a lot, I'm sure you see it is when a, a part that you're assembling actually has other components in it, whether they're you know, electrical components or some other component. And so uh, with this precise control, you, you, we really uh, don't have to worry much about uh, driving heat into areas where we don't want it and damaging other products. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and we're, we're mostly seeing that again with, with devices where you see electronics inside, that's a big push, but even for smaller medical devices like microfluidics and things like that, um, energy really needs to only be where, where the weld's happening and anything outside of that tends to be a disadvantage. So um, like I said, with the, the beam spot sizes here, these are like really theoretical beam spots. We can get this small. We don't typically go this with small, but um, we, we can if, if we need to and certain applications do call for it. So um, we see a lot of this, you know, with these very small beam spot sizes in small microfluidic chips or, in the automotive industry, we do a lot of sensor housings and things like that. So the, the heat is going directly into the joint and nowhere else. And we can also control the pattern of the beam. We control the power in essentially infinite vectors. Um, we can control the speed and we can control the number of passes. So we can really bring the heat up very slowly. We can bring it up very quickly. It really depends on the type of plastic and what's gonna be most suitable to your application, but there's a lot of flexibility with this process, so. All right, touching on a couple of these other things um, with, uh, you know, we, we can hold some very tight tolerances. So oftentimes the parts that we're after are usually require some amount of precision. Um, most of the examples you'll see today are 2D, but we can do 3D depending on, on some variables that you might throw our way. And we'll cover some of those here in a minute. Um, and we, we do have options for quality control. Uh, the, the last one I wanna say is that we, you know, this one kind of covers the particulate free and you're gonna see this video should play here. This is a, a weld happening in real time on two pieces of clear plastic. So we'll touch on the two micron welding clear to clear parts, but that gives you kind of an idea of, of what a weld would look like um, on a two micron part. But uh, you, you can see on the left here is a laser welded part, very precise um, sealing. We're almost almost always hermetically sealing parts. We rarely get applications that don't require that. Um, and with those high bond strengths, very precise beams, the, the, the welds come out looking quite well. Uh, they're Most of the time they don't need to be hidden. They don't need to be put behind any type of flanges or flash control because the weld itself usually looks like a nice clean wetted surface. So it's, it's great for customer facing parts as well. Um, one last thing I'll touch on before I move past the advantages and disadvantages is kind of the, that thermal stress to the part. So on the left there, we're showing an ultrasonic joints. Keep in mind, these are happening under polarized uh, microscopes. And so you can see kind of the stress um, in the part post weld. So on the left, you have the sonic weld. Uh, you can see there's kind of more stress left over after the weld, whereas the laser welding process, at least with the two micron in this case, it tends to relax the plastic a little bit. So 
that gives us that high bond strength, but also um, uh, if, if anything, we're, we're making the plastic uh, have less mechanical stress left over after the weld than you would see otherwise with other bonding methods. Josh, just out of curiosity, what, what is the, uh, the weld area size, like if, if a width of that joint, roughly? Yeah. So what you're looking at right here, this is, a, I believe this is about one and a half millimeters. Um, okay. And it, it can be smaller than that. So I think I had shown the slide prior to that, you know, we can get our beam spot sizes down quite small, actually even smaller than this 0.5 for one micron. It really just depends though. Sometimes if you go too small, uh, the energy density is too high and you can burn the plastic. Um, and then there's some other things to take into account. How thick is your upper layer? Um, what, what are we really trying to achieve? Do we really need a beam spot size that small? So there's a lot of different ways we can approach this, um, and, which kind of will bring me to my next section here about the, the information you should be ready to answer about your application. But if we need to get in those sub millimeter sizes, we can absolutely do that. But we've also welded things with five, 10 millimeter beam spot sizes, so. Um, let's cover really fast. Um, I, I like to show this slide really to give, uh, to give people an idea that the laser plastic welding path really isn't just about equipment. Um, you've probably experienced this getting other welding applications completed in the past, but, uh, laser welding is a relatively new, uh, to, to be fair, it was actually invented in the seventies, I believe by Toyota and the automotive industry. But since then it's, you know, it was kind of slow to take off anywhere outside the, the automotive industry. Um, but in the last 10, 15 years, it's really started to take off and become more of a predominant welding method. That being said, it's still less known to a lot of people. And so we spend a lot of time at Duquesne, like we're doing right now, um, on the education and consulting front. Um, and because we don't want to present this solution as a, uh, a black box, we want people to feel comfortable understanding what they're getting into. And so we spend a lot of time up front doing things like consulting or training courses or what you're listening to right now. Past that, um, one of the most critical steps in a path to successful laser welding is the applications development. We have currently a lab in, uh, in Oregon and also a lab in St. Charles, Illinois, right outside of Chicago. And we have uh, some very experienced application engineers that have seen thousands of applications. So the application portion of it is, is very critical for us for proving concept. Um, and we spend a lot of time with our clients in this step to ensure that we're getting a good solid product uh, before we even start talking about equipment. Um, we do offer some limited contract services. I only bring this up because lots of companies in the medical space and even the automotive space now require small batch runs to say, get them through clinical trials if you're in the medical field or even to win a contract with a, you know, if you're a tier one automotive supplier and you need to win a contract with one of your large OEMs, um, Sometimes it requires having 50 parts in hand that are welded the way that you're looking at, at welding them before you buy equipment. Um, we're not a contract manufacturer by any means, but we will do limited contract services to help kind of bridge you from those prototype parts into a piece of equipment uh, when it makes sense. And then of course, uh, Duquesne is an equipment supplier. So we are looking to sell equipment. The way that I like to explain this though is the equipment is a big part of that. Obviously the end goal, um, but we really provide solutions, not equipment. So that equipment isn't something that we look at as an appliance that we drop off on your back porch and then let you figure it out. It's delivered with a working solution um, and we guarantee that solution. And then of course we have the support after the fact, which can, you know, Duquesne has a, a pretty large presence worldwide. So we have support all over the globe. Um, I don't want to touch on this too much because it can get a little convoluted, but this can be a little bit helpful, maybe uh, snapshot it or come back to it if you need to. This just gives you an idea of, of what a typical path looks like. Um, you know, depending on the complexity of your application, there are some things that we need to hash out before we even start really talking about equipment uh, in any meaningful way. And so we kind of look at these in three phases, a discovery phase, the R&D and applications phase, and then a production phase. So the discovery, I oh, apologize about that. The discovery phase is really where I want to kind of touch on really fast. And this is making sure that you're getting the right information to either us or any other laser welding provider that you decide to work with um, and so we can best help you. Um, the reason I say that is if you're not getting asked these questions by a company that you're working with, you're probably going to get started on the wrong foot. Uh, we always want to look at these things through a lens of, 
sure, we can probably tool it up in the lab, but can we do it in a production scenario? So we have this project data sheet. We don't even always fill it out. It's more just kind of a reminder to let you know there are certain questions that we're going to be asking. And, and if you can answer most of them, that's great. If you can only get to the important ones, that's really going to um, speed up how quickly we can get you responses into uh, determining the viability of your application or the viability of a commercial solution. Um, so I'm showing this sheet here. Really the main ones to pay attention to are these yellow fields. Obviously we're gonna need some type of CAD or representation of what the part looks like so we can determine if we could tool it up. Um, other things that are important are timelines. Um, we ask these questions a lot, but we wanna make sure that we can fit our solution into a reasonable time frame. So a lot of customers will come to us and they only have uh, a few weeks or a month before they need to be in production. That's probably not gonna be enough. So uh, we have pulled out some miracles before, of course, but um, timeline is something that we always like to keep in the back of our mind while we're going through these steps with uh, our customers. Um, outside of that, and like I said, I'm really only going to touch on these important ones. How many samples are required if we're going to be uh, welding prototype parts for you? And then the big ones are going to be, what are your materials? What color requirements do you have for those materials? Um, this is the essential starting point, and I'll show you some more information on materials here in a little bit. Um, and then we want to talk production details. Um, how, you know, how many parts do you need to be running per year? What is your cycle time target? Those things are really going to help us understand, hey, can we take this from the lab and get it into a production solution? Um, so those are the important ones. Um, and those are the questions that you should be ready to answer and the information that you should be ready to provide. And to be frank, if you're not getting asked these questions, I would be a little bit concerned. So, all right, now into the, the more technical stuff. So we're gonna talk really quickly about the difference of the types of processes that we, uh, we offer, or these are really the two main processes that you'll see taking place in the industry today. Um, and they really all have to do with the wavelength of the laser, and that does significantly change um, the, the process and the way that we would approach your application. So there's, there's two main uh, process methods. Um, it, different companies have their own takes on these, but more or less this is the, this is the, um, the overview of these two and how they line up. So with one micron laser welding, you'll also hear this called through transmission laser welding. That'd be the technical term. We just like one micron. It's a little bit easier to remember. Uh, essentially, that's where we have a natural piece of plastic. It doesn't have to be, we'll get to the colors here in a little bit, but the idea is the most simplest form would be a natural piece of thermoplastic to an absorbing thermoplastic. The laser in this wavelength will go, most of that energy will pass right through that upper transmissive layer absorb into the lower layer and because we have these in tight contact that conduction will take place and you'll get a bond right at the joint. Uh, this is great for most applications. It's very fast um, and very precise, but there are times where you need to weld clear pieces of plastic. Uh, we see this a lot in the medical device industry where say putting carbon black in a lower part is not an option. Uh, in that case, oftentimes we're going to be looking at uh, two micron laser welding and Really what all we're doing there is we're bumping the laser wavelength from roughly 980 nanometers to 1,940 or roughly two microns. At that wavelength, the plastic is going to inherently absorb more laser energy than you would absorb with a one micron laser. And because of that, we're gonna be able to create this kind of volumetric bond. And I'll get to this in a little bit more detail as we talk about the two micron specifics. But the idea is that we're going to, we're still transmitting enough laser energy to get through the part, but we're going to be absorbing just enough to create um, a, a, essentially a volumetric heating throughout the part. One, one question I get a lot, uh, Josh, is uh, customers ask if there is a third, you know, like a bonding agent that has to be applied in order to uh, utilize laser welding. And obviously in this case, that's not the case. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. We do not need that with, um, you know, depending on which one of these we decide to go to. And those are discussions that we have often with clients. That being said, that is an option. Um, there are suppliers out there that provide, um, they're essentially solutions. They're typically, it's, it's a specialized IR absorber. Um, and those can be put into a, a solution like ethanol or something like that. And that can be pad printed or painted onto the part. And then rather than having to have an absorbing lower layer, you can have this kind of pseudo absorption at the weld interface. Um, we do do some of that, 
most of the time we can achieve it without it. It's just one thing, you know, it's an additional consumable. Sometimes it can be difficult to apply. So it adds a step prior to welding um, that can be a little bit of a headache sometimes, but it is something that's possible to do. So um, let's see here. I'm gonna kind of move through these. We get this question a lot, which one's better, one micron or two micron? And the answer to that is it, it's not really the best question. Uh, we can do both. So it's really what's more suited to your application. And we're going to work through you with that. But the main questions there, like I showed you on that project data sheet, are going to be things like, what are your color? Uh, what are your material requirements? What are your color requirements? Um, and then we're going to be looking at other things like the joint design itself. And is that conducive to one or two micron? Um, and usually between these two different processes, we can find a solution for you. So let's move into the one micron uh, technical overview first. So again, this is like I mentioned, it's through transmission laser welding, passing the laser through the upper piece of thermoplastic into an absorbing lower piece. And this will make more sense as we move on. There's, keep in mind, we're, we're really only talking about one micron right now. So kind of put two micron to the side. Um, there's, there's four main things to keep in mind for one micron laser welding. One, you need that IR transparent upper layer, like we mentioned. That's really going to be any thermoplastic in its natural state is going to have some transmissivity, uh, transmissivity to it. There are, of course, caveats and asterisks that we have to throw onto that. But uh, for the most part, any natural thermoplastic is going to work as an IR transparent upper layer. Then, of course, we need the IR absorbing lower layer. The majority of the time we're achieving that with say like a carbon black, carbon's a great absorber, but there are other options to get absorption without having to have the part be black. And we'll cover that in a minute. And then of course we need tight mechanical contact. Um, a lot of the time when engineers are first stepping into laser welding, everyone's so focused on the part where the laser's hitting the plastic and that's ev all everyone thinks about. But we find that about 90% of the time when we see failures, in welding, it has to do with how we are either clamping the parts or creating contact at the weld interface. If we don't have solid contact, you're going to have difficulty getting a weld, at least consistently, especially in high volume production. So we focus a lot of our effort on the design of the part and how we're going to tool it up. And then, of course, we need compatible materials. So if you're welding the materials with any other welding method, we're likely going to be able to weld them. But we'll show you some examples of uh, the plastics that we we've welded some of the data that we have and then also some of the dissimilar plastic comb combinations that we can weld. So just kind of reiterating, um, you know, you need that IR transmissive upper layer. Um, and really, it, the, the plastic doesn't have to be optically clear. It just needs to be IR transmissive. And we'll get to that uh, here in a minute because there's options. We can even weld black parts through black parts if needed. Uh, the IR absorbing lower layer, like I mentioned, most of the time we're doing this with carbon black, but there are other options to create absorption. Uh, carbon just tends to be really cheap. But of course, in the medical industry, black is not usually desirable for, you know, their marketing teams and things like that. So we can get around that. Um, this is a good slide. It just kind of shows what a, a very basic clamp nest would look like. So you have the nest on the bottom, then we're landing a clamp tool on top of it. We're either clamping up or we're clamping down. And then the beam goes around and traces the weld profile. So you can kind of get a nice cross section there of how we'd be welding a very simple application, just like a, a in this case, that would be like a sensor housing or electronic housing. And material compatibility. So I know it's a little bit redundant. I'll get to some of this in a minute. But the, the main things to keep in mind here with the material compatibility is we need overlapping melt temperatures to some extent. Um, and past that, and I'm no chemist, but you need to start looking at things like, are, do the polymer change? Are they actually chemically compatible? Are we going to get a true chemical bond rather than a mechanical bond? And then they need similar surface energies. But the main one is really the overlapping melt temperatures. Here's a good starting point. I do not recommend taking this at face value. We have welded things outside of this. Uh, as well. This is just a good jumping off point. So if you see your material combination on here, we're pretty much guaranteed to be able to weld it, barring any crazy additives you're putting into your plastic. Um, but don't take this, if, if you don't see your material combination on here, that doesn't mean that we can't give it a shot. So we do this a lot with material tests, and then we'll usually take that information and rebuild this, this uh, matrix here to ensure that that's included. So just because you don't see it on here doesn't mean it's not possible. 
And, and Josh, what about glass content? How does that um, impact the laser welding? Yeah, it absolutely does. So glass content is going to reduce transmissivity because it is going to scatter the light energy. Um, so usually with glass filled materials, we can weld glass filled materials up to 50%, which is usually higher than is needed. Um, but it's going to it's going to reduce or it's going to affect some of the other things that we're looking at. How thick is the upper layer? Uh, what material is it? It's so like a, a glass filled PBT. PBT is a semi crystalline plastic, which is also going to scatter the laser energy. So PBT glass filled tends to we're going to need it to be a little bit thinner, um, whereas like a PC. Uh, a natural PC with no additives or anything is incredibly clear and optically clear. And so we can usually pass through more plastic on uh, amorphous and very optically clear plastics. So there is definitely some effect between amorphous plastics, semi-crystalline, uh, things like glass fills will affect the process. But as long as we're taking that into account early on in the design phase, we can usually get around it. Um, and then one thing to note is flame retardants are usually a no-go in the upper layer. Uh, we can usually get away with them in the lower layer, but the upper layer, the flame retardants tend to block the laser energy pretty effectively. So just a couple notes there on additives. Um, you sounded like a chemist, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> I wish, yeah, not quite, but you say it enough times and you start to remember these things. Um, color combinations, this is a question we get a lot because obviously, you know, you see a lot of one micron welds and they're gonna be clear to black, natural to black. Um, that is definitely not the only combination we can do. We, we've done every combination under the sun, but there are limitations. So this is showing the degree of difficulty as you move up into different color combinations. So natural to black is gonna be the easiest there on the left. Surprisingly, black to black is the next easiest, but it's, uh, you, we still have the carbon black filled lower layer, but the upper layer is actually just doped with a very dark red or green inorganic dye. So, or blue dye, but it's so dark to the naked eye, it looks black, but the laser can see right through it. And actually here's an example of where you're looking at a black uh, upper layer with a carbon black lower layer in a visual spectrum. And then if we look at it under an IR camera on the same wavelength as the laser, you can see the joint right there. So we can quite effectively weld black to black. It's actually very easy. We just have to work with your, uh, your molder, your compounder to ensure that they have the right mixes. So of course you can't have the same plastic mix in the upper and the lower layer. You're gonna have to differentiate those. So keep that in mind, you know, if you're gonna have family molds and things like that, it's important to remember. Uh, moving up the ladder, then you have like a color to a black and this can be any color, red, blue, green, orange, doesn't really matter. Um, but you're going to still have your carbon black lower layer. Um, this is just usually, it's not really any more difficult than the black to black. It just requires working with your color compounder to get the right combinations. Um, a color to a color, this is achieved by actually stripping out the carbon black in most cases and then using a specialized laser absorber. And there's plenty of companies that offer these things. The reason that we bring that degree of difficulty up a little bit is because carbon is such a good absorber. When you pull that out and put one of these other specialized absorbers in, they still absorb very effectively, but sometimes it can be hard to color match, um, which is why a like to a like material color is a little bit more difficult because this lower layer has to have that specialized additive in it. Usually it's going to be kind of a translucent green or a translucent smoke color. And in order to get your compounder to be able to color match those perfectly, we've, we've done it, we've seen it done, but it can be difficult. So that adds a degree of difficulty, not necessarily on the laser welding side, just on the material side. And then uh, really there should be two here. We, we would go clear to white next and then white to white would be the hardest. So the reason white is difficult is because it has titanium dioxide in it. Titanium dioxide uh, is a great reflector of IR radiation. Think sunscreen, you know, it's white has a lot of times has titanium in it and that's going to reflect the laser energy. So it doesn't matter if it's in the lower layer or the upper layer, um, it, it's difficult, but we have welded them. As you can see here, we have a, a clear to a white example and we have welded white to white in the past. So this just gives you uh, a couple of examples of colors that we've seen welded or have welded ourselves. Uh, joint profiles. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this. Uh, we, we have this in our design guideline as well, which you can find on the website, which kind of walks you through this in a little bit more detail. 
point is we can get away with quite a few different joint styles, two dimensional parts, lap joints, things are going to be quite simple. Most of the time with one micron, we're going to be running something similar to almost an ultrasonic energy director, but we just, it's a sacrificial rib. So rather than pointed, it's going to be flat on top. And most of the time we're just doing that to uh, collapse that rib and overcome any tolerances in the part. So we would discuss that with you in the design phase, in the discovery phase, um, before you start releasing molds to determine which joint profile is going to be best for you. Of course, we can also do radial welds. Um, they don't have to be perfectly uh, cylindrical. The point is, in this case, we're not using clamp force in most cases to create that contact, which is really important. We're using an interference fit, and that helps get that contact at the joint surface that we need. And there's quite a few different ways we can introduce the laser to this. And then, of course, we can do 3D specialty joints as well. Um, moving on here, we've got, I, I like to show this. This is a lab system. Please keep in mind, this is not what we're going to be selling you. Um, this I, I'm showing this because it pulls all the guarding off and you can see the guts of what's actually going on behind the system. So we have the scanner up top. That's what's driving the pattern of the beam. You can see the fiber being fed into it um, there in that red fiber in the back. A clamp unit, of course, we need that. The, these look, these come in all different flavors, shapes, and sizes. Uh, in this case, we're clamping up into a fixed plate. Of course, we need a next nest and fix or fixture to locate the part properly to avoid any issues with tolerances. Uh, and then the upper clamp plate, something to clamp against. And we'll get to that in a little bit here, some different designs. Uh, Duquesne has its own proprietary software for driving the contour and controlling most of the functions of the machine. Machine base, obviously. And then the laser source you can see sitting down below there. So that's the guts of the system. And I show you that because if you go to a production unit, it's gonna look more like this, all the same stuff inside of it but uh, it's, this is a laser class one system. So it can be operated by a user that doesn't have to have any PPE or anything like that um, to allow them to run this machine, it's completely safe. So uh, really it's the same thing I just showed you, but this has guarding and all of the PLCs and safety controllers on it. So. Here's a basic clamp unit, very similar to the one I just showed you. This is very basic, something we'd mostly have in a lab. So this is not indicative really of a production clamp. It just kind of gives you an idea of what we're looking at uh, from a really basic perspective. And then the different types of clamp tools. So we actually three, we have three that we use mostly. So I'm showing two here. Um, on the left, we have a glass or acrylic. That's really where the plate itself is just sitting right on the part. This is really good for uh, two dimensional shapes. If we're using acrylic, we can sometimes do uh, some three dimensions with this, depending on, on what they are. Um, glass is really strictly used for two micron welding because if we were doing uh, two micron welding with acrylic, we'd end up bonding that clamp to your part, which would obviously not be ideal. So we had swapped that acrylic for glass with two micron. We can do all metal outer stamps as well. And that's where we're just clamping, you know, metal to the outside of the part right inside or right outside of the joint. Um, but the one we see probably the most is what we kind of, we call hybrid clamp tooling. And that's where we're going to have an inner and an outer metal stamp landing on the part. Um, and it looks like my beam profile is off a little bit there. Uh, but the idea is this allows us to land metal or a Delrin on the part, um, which is going to be a little bit more robust. If you get particulates on that acrylic piece up top, then it can tend to burn. So by not landing it directly on the part, we can avoid a lot of that. Uh, and still get really solid clamping right next to the joint. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit of this because like I said, it's in our design guide. So if you're starting out designing joints for laser welding, one, contact uh, CapEx Sales and they'll, they'll get you in touch with some of the guys at Duquesne or myself. Um, but you can start with uh, the design guidelines on, on the Duquesne website. Um, and I'm just mostly doing that for saving time. But we do have things that we're looking at that are important to keep in mind when you go to design a part, like not shadowing our beam, how to design a joints, when to uh, use different types of joint styles, et cetera. Yeah, so I'm gonna skip, well this, I mean, keep in mind plastics operate like an optic. So if you pass a laser through uh, an upper layer, it's going to, it's going to refract. 
to some degree. So the more steep those angles are, these are things that we need to keep in mind. Um, sometimes we can account for them by biasing the beam inside. Sometimes we can't. So just things to notice, to note. Um, different types of processes, uh, contour welding. This would be essentially where we're just passing the beam around your joint single pass. Um, we see a lot of lap joint type applications or radio weld applications like this. Simultaneous welding, this is where you're essentially flashing the entire beat, the entire joint all at once. Uh, there's myriad different ways to go about that. What we tend to use the most is what we call quasi-simultaneous welding though. And this is where we're going to pass the beam around the part multiple times very, very quickly to essentially simultaneously heat the joint all at once. That allows the entire joint to be molten. And in the instance that we have say collapse ribs, then we can uh, collapse those evenly without putting stress on the part. So this is the one we probably see the most, especially in one micron welding. Um, really quickly, how a scanner works, because I do get this question a lot. This is a video from one of our vendors, Relays. Um, and this is just gonna show you the guts of a scanner. So really at the end of the day, what you're looking at is two mirrors um, and those are coded if, for different wavelengths. And then they're driven by very precise servos. And um, the direction that those mirrors are oriented to each other and the introduction of the beam is going to essentially trace whatever pattern that we program into the software. So this is also used for laser marking as well, which is kind of more the application you're seeing here. All right, let's jump into two micron really quick. How are we doing on time, Chris? You're good, yeah, keep going. That's great. Good deal. All right, so moving into two micron, so you can kind of put uh, put to side the one micron stuff we just talked about. We're just talking about mostly clear to clear. That doesn't mean it has to be clear to clear, but in most cases, this is the direction we're going. So the first thing to talk about, the reason this works, we were just talking about one micron welding, and that would be in this wavelength roughly of 800 nanometers to about 1064. And, and there's some play in this, but these are kind of more your industry standard themes. So if you start seeing um, companies discuss wavelengths like this, they're talking through transmission laser welding or what we call one micron. What you see here is that at these different types of plastics, you have a very high transmissivity rate. So we're looking at the wavelength of the laser on the x-axis, the transmission rate, how much energy is going through the plastic on the y-axis. You can see with in these wavelengths, you have a very high transmission rate, sometimes even in 95% plus. But if we go to two micron, you can see this blue bar here. Um, we are dropping our transmissivity, not drastically, um, but we're dropping it just enough where we kind of fall into that Goldilocks zone where we're, transmit we're transmitting enough energy through the upper layer to get to the joint but there's enough inherent absorption. In this case, it's anywhere between 20 to 30% of that energy is going to be inherently absorbed in the plastic. And that allows us to create that bond, which is why with a two micron weld process, you're gonna create these volumetric bonds because some of the energy is passing through, but some of it is being retained in the plastic. And so you can see under a polarized lens, we're creating this nice relaxed joint that does go all the way through the part. And that's what allows us to bond clear pieces of plastic or natural pieces of plastic without any additives to absorb the laser because uh, you do get that inherent absorption. Now, of course, that does come with some downfalls and imagine, you know, if, you, if, if we're fairly thin here and that laser doesn't start to dissipate, if we had anything beneath this, whether it's features, other features, channels, or even circuit boards or things like that, we need to be cognizant of that, that we're not going to be affecting anything below the weld. So those are things that we need to take into account. Um, so like general guidelines, um, most of the time with two micron, we don't really want to see semi-crystalline plastics. It usually tends to work better with amorphous. So like PBT is not going to play very well with, with, uh, two micron, the upper part thickness really needs to be limited. And, and this is somewhat material dependent, but it needs to be limited to about 3.5 millimeter upper layer thickness. Cause keep in mind, we can only get through so much plastic before that transmission is going to completely dip off. So we found about 3.5 millimeters is about the, the, at least it's a good rule of thumb. We can weld most color combinations. Uh, so it doesn't have to be clear to clear. We can do clear to white, clear to pigmented, clear to black. Um, but the point is most of the time, this is just requested for clear to clear. We don't like glass fills. It really does not work well. I'm not saying we can't try it, but uh, 
it, it doesn't usually tend to work in in two micron welding scatters too much um and then some of the same guidelines apply we still need really tight contact at the weld joint keep in mind two micron will bridge those gaps a little bit better than one micron but we're still talking fractions of millimeters so we want to have nice tight contact uh, we do a lot of tube components so radial welds are totally doable and we can we can do three-dimensional shapes but most of the time with two micron we're seeing uh, something relatively two-dimensional in terms of the joint profile one thing to note is we do in in most cases especially if aesthetics are concerned we want to contain the the joint itself so because of that volumetric heating if you don't have any containment on these two parts you're going to, as that plastic expands and it heats and then it cools, you're going to kind of create these little um, deformations. Sometimes they look like divots, sometimes they're protrusions from the plastic. Um, but if we clamp them, we can pretty much alleviate them entirely. And so we're using the clamping in this case, obviously, to create contact between the parts, but also in a lot of cases to uh, ensure that the weld looks nice. With two micron welding, in most cases, we're doing contour welding, which is a single pass. Now, we break this rule quite often, but we're not really doing true quasi-simultaneous welding um, where we're trying to bring up the heat of the entire joint all at once. Two microns is just a little bit slower. Keep in mind, we're only getting about 30% of the laser energy into the plastic. And so if you're running at 100 watts, you're really only getting effectively maybe 30 plus watts into that plastic. So it can't move quite as fast as one micron uh, in most cases couple of examples of applications here so you see a lot of tubing stuff but a lot of a lot of flat things as well so a lot of tubing connectors um, we we do do some stuff with um, bag welding um, mostly for r d purposes because laser welding is again quite flexible um, so like switching from say an an ir or a or a hot plate type weld, um, you know, you're not as limited with the tools. With the two micron, we can essentially create any shape we want. So we see we have some companies that are interested in it for just proving out bag welds, and then they'll actually move their process over to like a like a IR uh, heating process. Yeah, a lot of customers use RF welding, which and uh, RF, you know, yeah, it, yeah. and it, it, that can be challenging in its own right with the equipment. <laughs> Yep. So we, we see a lot of these big customers that, that mostly use it for R and D uh, and then they might move it over or they might stick with laser welding. It kind of just depends on what they're after. So another uh, radial weld here, you can kind of see that bond. It's a little bit light, but you can see it right there. These are some microfluidics. Um, these were prototypes, um, but you can see these are very, very small beams. I mean, we're talking weld widths of 0.2 millimeters. So we can get very small. Keep in mind, these are done on thin films. So if you try to do this with two millimeter thick pieces of PC or COC, it's probably not going to be, we're not going to be able to get that beam that small. But if you're dealing with thin films, we can get those beams really, really small. We can get really small weld joints. So a couple of other application images. So this is a tubing application that we ran, um, I believe, out of our lab in, in St. Charles, Illinois. Um, and you can see, like I mentioned prior, you can see that slight deformation bump because we didn't actually contain this. We can contain this with a sleeve of, you know, some type of material that we can pass the laser energy through. We have a few options and patents on those. Um, but in this case, the customer didn't require that. So this was just ran open. And so you can see that little deformation bump. They didn't care. But if we if we had to fix that, we could easily do it. So just kind of something to note there. couple more applications. This is before the welding and then after. You can see it It really did close up that whole weld. And we even ma managed to bridge some of the gaps uh, vertically as well. So it, it is possible because that melt's going to start flowing volumetrically through the plastic. I'm not going to guarantee that in every case, but it is doable. So I think that kind of, uh, that kind of wraps up um, the end of the presentation. I have, I'm more than happy, Chris, if you have some questions or some specifics that you'd like me to touch on, we can go through those now. Yeah, well, I think, first of all, thank you very much for uh, sharing all of your knowledge and, and, and uh, all this information. It, it's, uh, the, the, I'm sure 
I know I'll have some questions as I start to think about different applications out there with my customer base. And certainly um, for our customers out there, uh, we welcome you to connect with us. Uh, we, we'd like to get involved as early in the process uh, as possible uh, so that we can ensure and, and help guide you to a successful project. Um, and, and we appreciate all of our customers out there. Without, without you guys, we, we don't exist. So thank you very much for um, joining and, and, and um, being, uh, being a part of this. Uh, Josh, I can't thank you enough. You did great. And uh, I'm sure we'll have some follow-up activity as, uh, as more customers get, uh, get to see this as well. So thank you very much. Yeah, no problem, Chris. And I just tack onto that. If uh, if anyone has questions or you want to even explore laser welding, just reach out to Chris and most likely he'll be in touch with me. Um, but obviously we have this presentation available. There's design guidelines that Chris can get you as well and any of this information. But um, if you do have a project, the, the best approach is just to pitch it our way and we can really give you a lot of insight rather than trying to go find this information. There's plenty of information online, but um, we can point you in the right direction within a day. So you don't have to waste a lot of time doing that. Um, and that's usually as simple as you giving us what materials you have and your CAD. And I can tell you if you're in the ballpark or not really quick, so. Excellent, good deal. Well, uh, yep, you can see Josh's uh, contact information there on the screen. Um, you can find uh, CapEx sales contact uh, myself, Chris Mullins, on our website, uh, Matt Matheny and Russ Sorrells as well. Um, if you just go to capexsales.com, you can uh, find a way to connect with us. And uh, thanks again, Josh. Uh, thank you, customers. We appreciate you guys and uh, look forward to uh, continuing discussion on laser plastic welding. Thanks, Chris. All right. Take care. We'll see you. Bye. Bye, everybody.